Hi friends, it's Janine Richards from Q101. Welcome to The Tour Life. Grab your All Access Pass and join me behind the scenes of the music industry. Together, we'll discover how to live happier and healthier lives doing what we love. Today's guest is an audio engineer who has worked with artists such as Group Love, Plain White Tees, Lizzo, Michael Bolton, and many others. Since we recorded this episode in the middle of the pandemic, she has co-founded the nonprofit Bring Light to the Night, whose mission is to shine light into the darkest spaces of the entertainment industry. In this episode, we have a truly candid and much needed conversation about the realities that women face in the workplace, specifically in the concert touring world. We explore how sharing our story, owning our truth, and working on being self-aware can be some of the most empowering things that we can do for ourselves. You can find her on Instagram at soundlady13, sharing all sorts of awesome audio tips, and at her nonprofit, Bring Light to the Night. Here is my conversation with the wonderfully candid and sincere Laureen Bohannon. Hi, Laureen. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Janine? I'm really good. Thank you so much for hopping on the podcast with me. Graham introduced me to you because I was trying to get him to come on. And then he's like, no, 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 you need to talk to Laureen. So, (laughs) so nice to meet you. Graham put me in touch with so many people. I can't, I haven't even had time to sort through them all. (laughs) So thank you. So for reaching out, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, absolutely. And then I also saw that you know, Mary, who was on the podcast. Oh yeah, Mary Broadbent. (laughs) Yes. She's a good friend of mine. She's actually, um, we worked on the plain white tees together and we know each other from sound girls. Oh yeah. And actually she did mention sound girls when we talked and I know that you started star Phoenix productions. What's the goal of star Phoenix Productions? Well, I incorporated a business right when quarantine happened to help me deal with what was about to happen in the industry. Like I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to create a business. So I incorporated star Phoenix productions to do content consulting and sales for things that I'm working on or starting businesses for. Like I've started doing some management for a weed brand in this time. I've started creating content for him as well, like product photos and things like that. I'm also developing my own online business and I've been doing like home studio consultations. So that's what Star Phoenix Productions is covering for me for right now. That's super cool. Yeah. It's kind of like your umbrella company for all the projects you want to do, huh? Yeah, because in California, they're very funny about businesses operating. So I wanted to make sure I had a company. And then as I decide more specifically what I would like to do with my companies, then I will do DBAs for the separate things. If I need an entity that does sales specifically, then I'll create a DBA that's like Star Phoenix distribution or something. And that'll cover whatever sales I'm going to end up doing. I just am unsure of what I was going to end up doing. So I just covered all the bases. I feel that. I'm like, I have a, I was talking to my boyfriend yesterday and I'm like, I guess I kind of have a media company now because I have a podcast and I just started a YouTube channel. And then I don't know, I'll probably do other stuff. And then it was also funny because I'm like, and technically I've been in media since 2012 because I worked a group on and the guy who recruited me to work at WBZ, which is like Chicago's NPR station. um, He told me, he's like, oh, you're in media sales. Right. And I'm like, I am. I really thought I just sold coupons. <laughs> so anyway, media company. But yeah, I totally get that about about starting that because it does open you up so that you're able to protect yourself legally and stuff. So that's really cool. So do you want to tell me what led you to where you are today? Did you always know that you wanted to be in the music industry? Kind of in a weird way. I mean, I started do- doing sound when I was 16. I started actually mixing when I was 17. I got taken on by a sound company when I was really young from high school. Like I was involved in stage crew and stuff like that when I first got started. And then in my junior year, we had a teacher who's my adopted mom now, but she came in and um, brought in a theater program and started bringing in professional production. And so that's how I got introduced to being a professional production person. They were very, they were good. They became good friends of mine, but these guys were like a pain in the butt when I first got started. They'd be like, you can help us, but only if you know how to wrap a cable and we're not going to tell you. And I was like, game on, let's do this thing. And so I feel like my career is a really amalgamation of you can't, you can't do that. Like, oh, watch me. (laughs) That's why I am where I am. So that's how I got here. I live in California now. I moved here 
less than three years ago. <laughs> ah, thanks, coronavirus. But I moved here to further my career because I was in Pennsylvania and there is only so far you can go there in the ladder. I know some people have a little bit easier time climbing, but as a woman, it's very hard to get um, um, confidence, support, uh, my reputation, having to get the experience of a higher level of being in California, even though I had done audio for. 12 years by the time I came here, still somehow I was less qualified than other people with significantly less experience than me for the similar positions, which is why I'm here now. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, everyone does say that the opportunity's there and everybody's capable of, of doing it all, but some people ha do have to work harder to actually get there. I get that totally. So how has it been since you moved? What expectations did you have and how did they line up with reality? Hmm, That's a funny story because most of my expectations didn't line up at all. So some of the things that I expected in California is that women would be treated better in the industry, that there wouldn't be as much divisiveness in the industry, a little bit more acceptance that there would be a wider spectrum of people to work with. And the first most disappointing one for me is that women aren't actually farther ahead here in California. And in fact, I thought I was going to meet a lot more women than I did in this business. I kind of came over here with the expectation that I was going to learn from people to advance myself. And I don't want to sound like pompous or anything, but the reality is that's not what happened. I came over here and ended up being a teacher for people and a mentor, and I end up giving sessions and things like that. So that's definitely one of the expectations that I wasn't expecting <laughs> to not be fulfilled. But I feel like throughout my career, that's been an expectation that I've always had. I don't know as much as this person, so you know, let me go and ask them. And then I feel like a lot of people in our business get to a point where they're like, I do know, I do know. And that's how I, that's why I came to California. And then I got over here and it was all the same thing that I had just dealt with. Like, are you sure? Are you sure you really know what you're doing? Do you have to prove it? I, I get that in our business, people are always proving themselves, but it's a different level when you're a woman. Like it doesn't matter. Every room I step into, every person I, I talk to, every male that I work with, I have to prove myself. And coming to California, I had a lot of people that were not very supportive that I met along the way that made it a little bit more difficult for me at certain junctures of this thing because I'm not sure, but there's been some really interesting revelations that I've had. And uh, it's kind of where I am, why I am where I am now and saying the things I'm saying now, because I realized that I'm not the only one going through this in the industry and that there's a lot of other women here that go through this. And so I'm not going to be quiet about what's happened to me and what continues to happen to me in the industry anymore, because the reality is, is it's there and it's happening. And I've spent most of my career, you know, just going along to get along. Um, and I'm kind of done with that. And it's made things a little bit uncomfortable. And that definitely wasn't my expectation of coming to California. I thought we would already be past this point. And to find out we're not is probably one of my dis biggest disappointments. Yeah. And it can be really hard to, I don't know, it's as a woman, right? You know, you never, you never want to seem like you're pulling the, the woman card and you're seeing it just from your perspective exactly. and you're leaving the men out of the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. I can 100% see how that would be really difficult to find a good balance where you're speaking up for yourself and you're helping to progress the industry and in, in what I would say is the right way while still maintaining that sort of respect just for the your craft and what you actually do and the work that you actually put in. Look, I love what I do and I love the men and the women and everybody that I work with, but the reality is, is there is still some underlying um, cultural and just work related prejudices that exist that are ingrained into the industry. And like, I'm not blaming anyone. I'm not accusing anyone. This isn't a negative thing. It's just the reality. It's just the reality. These are things that happen. It's not like I'm going to say that it didn't happen to make someone else feel more comfortable. It happened and it continued to happen. I mean, I was on tour with the biggest artist of 2019, one of the biggest artists, 2019 Lizzo this last year. And honestly, I faced more 
issues over being a woman on this tour than I ever have from mostly local crews. So it was a really interesting experience to continue to have to deal with this. And it's 2020 and I've been doing this for 14 years and almost nothing has changed from the time I was a 16 year old girl. The only thing that has changed, and this is this is going to be like a, a little bit of a controversial thing to say, but the reality is, is now that I'm 30, men don't treat me the same way that they did when I was 17 or 18 and young. I don't have the same type of sexual harassments happen to me. I don't have the same type of inappropriate advances happen to me because I feel like there is a particular advantage taken of young, naive girls in the music industry. And we don't just see it within the technical side. We see it within the artists. Look at Miley Cyrus. Look at all these really young stars and how they, how they turn out, how they're sexualized and all that in the business. There is still some of that and, and it's a cultural thing, but it, it definitely, like the things that happened to me when I was younger would never happen to me now. That's one of the biggest, weirdest realities I've had to face. And it's not, I don't want to accuse anybody. I want to offer ways to make it change. I'm just tired of it being an uncomfortable subject. Just like mental health is an uncomfortable subject in touring and us talking about it, it's starting to be more of a regular conversation. The reality is, is that there's harassment on the road and it's not just exclusive to women. There's harassment for men. There's ha harassment for gay men. There's harassment for black men or black women on the road. There's discrimination. It, it exists out there. And our world is like the last pirate ship. Some things are allowed to be done in our world that on other workspaces, they would get fired over. Conversations are allowed to happen in our workspace that if you were in a normal place with an HR department, people would be fired. And that's totally normal. And I'm not saying that that's negative, but I do think we have to change the culture a little bit and the conversation if we want to make it a more habitable place for people who are not, uh, you know, a man, uh, just a general white man. So... I want us to just look at that with a grain of salt and see the lack of our black brothers and sisters, people of color, women, transgender people, even more than being a woman, trying to be a transgender person in this business is almost impossible. Yeah, 100%. I mean, and right now it's like everyone's being forced to have these really difficult conversations and people are starting to realize that it is real and we are so different and we we have to talk about it before you can accept anything and before you can have any change actually happen. You have to actually have that conversation. And so I I completely agree that it's really important. And you bring up a really good point with the whole, there not being really a structure to look to when it comes to expressing the things that happen that are negative, where in a regular corporate environment, you would just, you would just go to HR immediately. And so that's something that I think people can't really reconcile because the average person doesn't look at the music industry as a business. They see a show, it's a blip in their life, and that's it. And then they, they move on. But, but it's your every day. It's your whole life. And it is a business. And there should be protections that there are in other industries. Well, yeah, we're definitely seeing it with coronavirus. Look at our business right now. Look at the people in our business. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how we're going to survive. Most of us are trying to get jobs and can't even get through. I have a specialized resume for 14 years. I'm an audio engineer. That is what I have done since I am 16 years old. And yes, that has skills within it that are very relevant. To, I mean, I've been a production manager. I've been a tour manager. I've managed artists. But translating that to like corporate life and trying to get a job or a job in another place is extremely difficult. And so we're definitely seeing our industry reconsider what type of protections and what type of work they want to do within it even in as much as what type of contracts are you willing to sign like how much are we willing to now sacrifice our personal life and our health for this job because the reality is as you know most of us like our artists don't care anything about us i'm getting no help from my people anybody that I've worked with. And I know that everybody else is out there and the people that are getting help from their artists are so lucky and extremely lucky to have such a caring, a caring person. But that's not the reality of our business. It is almost a corporate environment. Like you're hired for your skills and your job, not necessarily because you're close or family with an artist, especially as you get into the higher levels. So do we need a union? Maybe not. Do we need to have like a fund or something for protection of, you know, music industry workers in case something like this ever happens? Yes, I do think we need to have an organization or a representative body that's going to help us affect change in our industry in more than just a talked about way. Like, 
we're a $2 billion powerhouse industry in the American economy. There is no reason that we shouldn't have the same type of organizations that other extremely established I- industries have, such as travel, tourism. Like there are whole departments on that. So I'm unsure of why our industry is forgotten about in America. I mean, even the UK just passed its stimulus package for their entertainment industry. I didn't know that, but it's, and, and having that happen in the US would be shocking. I, I mean, I, shocking. I wouldn't even believe it. <laughs> well, because it probably wouldn't happen. We can't even get acknowledgement now. Live Nation and AEG went to bat for us with the uh, PUA and stuff like that. But the reality is, is there's not a whole lot of people fighting for us um, and to help us. And people forget about us because we're the silent ones. We're not the artists. We're the ones you don't see. We're the ones behind the scenes in black, all dressed in black, not meant to be seen. We did our job the right way. All of America didn't notice us. But uh, <laughs> hey, we need some help, y'all. So I definitely think that that is very much <laughs> true. Again, I think the main thing is talking about it because I I honestly don't know a lot of people who are outside of the industry who would even consider any of it. It's just not part of the conversation at all. I agree. It's not part of the conversation at all. Yeah. And it's easy to support the band, right? You buy the merch and you buy the tickets and whatever, and you can buy their music and everything. But what are some ways that people can actually help the crew? Well, there are actually some great funds available and some nonprofits that have formed. There's one great one that was started by two people that I've toured with in Warp Tour named Frank Fernelli and Tatiana Danielle. And they started an organization called For the Nomads. Um, which is actually to help touring people. They can apply to get grants and money to help them through this time. And it's a nonprofit organization. They're actually taking donations from bands as well. So they do auctions. So they'll take in drum kits and guitars from artists that have contributed and then they auction them off and that's how they fund it right now. But they're also accepting those type of donations. You can donate to the Live Nation Fund. There are actually a lot of organizations that have begun because of this, because of the lack of help in our industry. Music Cares is another great one that is through the Grammys. Um, And Music Cares has been helping musicians for years now. And things like Music Cares helps pay your rent if you get injured. Like if you get an injury on the road, because most of us don't have health insurance at all, Music Cares will help you. So they've been an incredible uh, grace in our industry. I would suggest donating to them as well. And even in as much as if your friends are asking for help and they're one of us, maybe consider giving them the help. If they're saying, hey, I don't have a, I don't have a fan and I can't afford to buy one right now. If you have an extra one laying around, be like, hey, you know, I kind of got one. Do you need it? And like, we're proud people a little bit. Of course, we're all our own businesses. So it's hard for us to ask for help. But we do need help right now. So if you see someone struggling, a great way you can help is just to ask if they need help or if they need anything or even someone to talk to. Because we're alone, more more so than a lot of other people in other industries. Many of us are very alone. Like I don't have a significant other. I didn't have one the entire time I was touring. I've only been in Los Angeles for less than three years. So I don't have a strong friend group. So I've been reaching out to a lot of people just to talk to them. And I've been really honest about my emotions too. You know, when I need help, I reach out. So I think that's that's the important thing right now is to like have a little bit of compassion and kindness. And if you see someone struggling, reach out and see if there's any way you can help them. Were, were you always the type of person that was open with your emotions and how you were feeling and reaching out for help? No. How did that not. happen? I've been on my own since I was 16. Uh, My mother passed away and my father was never in the picture. And he actually passed away about six years later. So I actually don't have any family. So um, I, I was, I was always the strong one. Like I buried my mom. I did the funeral. I was 16 years old. It wasn't until I was in my mid twenties and I met a wonderful human who actually taught me how to love, be loved and accept love and deal with some of the things that had happened in my life. But I was able to start the uh, process of acknowledging and dealing with my emotions and traumas. And it's only in the last like two years that I've been really comfortable talking and being emotional. Um, It's kind of weird. It's a very vulnerable place to be. But the reality is, is like, people need to see it. 
people need to see me talking about this stuff. I'm just as passionate about my job as anything and people can see that passion when I talk about it. So I want to make sure that people can see whatever emotion I'm trying to express in anything I say now. I don't want anything to be misconstrued. I don't want anyone to think I was being sarcastic. I'd rather just be the straight, honest truth with you. I've become very blunt, very honest, very much tell you what I need, what I'm not comfortable with. And as it's often uncomfortable for other people who aren't used to that type of truth or honesty. But I found it's very much um, helped my soul. And definitely during quarantine, having started this process earlier and having this time with myself has really been incredibly important into healing some of the things that even touring has done, you know, the loneliness it causes, the, the juxtaposition between being on the road with those people and coming home, the loss of personal life. I, I definitely have realized that I don't ever want to lose as much control over my personal life as I have over the last couple of years. Yes, I love what I do, but that doesn't mean that's all that I am. So that's definitely definitely been a process. And it's not easy. And if anyone is even starting the process of going through you know, dealing with your emotions and trying to be more honest to who you are. It's hard. It takes years and it's work. Don't be discouraged. There are ups and downs. Like I've had ups and downs and don't be afraid to ask for help. You're not a one person island. That's what I realized is nobody succeeds alone. There's always people that help you along the way and acknowledging them and being kind to them and reaching out to them is what they're there for. Most of them are your friends. They're your family. They're people that love you. And once you realize that you're not an island, it becomes so much better. How did it feel to realize that you weren't alone? Because that's kind of the difference, right? Like really understanding you're not alone and it is okay to share. How did that realization feel? Scary. It felt scary. It was like enlightening, but it was also terrifying at the same time because understanding the ramifications of speaking up and sometimes saying what I mean and being honest it's terrifying, especially in a world where, and especially a business that, you know, emotions are weak. You don't get sick when you're on tour. You stand out of front of house and vomit into a bucket. That's the game. But you're dying sick, still loading in. That's what we do. So, you know, um, it, 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 it's scary. It's scary to be vulnerable in a place where that's not really accepted. It's scary to talk about things that people don't want to talk about or are uncomfortable, particularly when it re- when it relates to people who don't, who sometimes don't want to take a look at themselves and see what they're doing or see the culture that they are creating. So it's scary. And it's, it's, it's strange. I worry how it might affect my career negatively. But I very much try to be succinct and kind and understanding as well, because I know that life is life and people are people and things happen. And if someone doesn't know they're doing wrong, then you can't be mad at them if they didn't know. So like, if they're doing something wrong, and I don't say anything, am I in the right? Or am I in the wrong for perpetuating that? You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I'm at now. Like, if I don't say something here, is he going to do the same thing to the next person? Um, and, and it's, it's still scary, man. But I try, I try every day. I've tried to make my reputation as strong as possible with my work and the work I've done that hopefully what I say has a little bit of credence. And when you run into those situations where it's hard to actually say what you want to say and say how you feel, what is lying underneath as far as your perspective on people? Do you believe that people are inherently good? Yes. Or what is it? I believe that people are inherently good. Like, look at children. Look when they come out. Look at the toddlers. Look how unbelievably kind and sweet and and loving they are to each other. You learn habits. You learn them from other people. You learn them from society. You learn them from who's around you. So that's like when I when I'm when I'm talking about this, and you know, I'm uncomfortable. I'm trying to. I'm trying to reach a, across a gap. What I'm thinking about people also is while I know that they're inherently good, I've had horrible experiences with men in my life. I've had moments where I've spoken up when something really horrible has happened to me and I'm the one that gets fired and doesn't get called back. I'm the one that gets a bad reputation. I'm the one that gets, you know, uh, (laughs) excuse my French, but shit on. Like, 
when I say something because they're all, they're buddies, they're friends, they're, they didn't see it happen. That's just the culture. I, I've had such awful things to me that that's also in the back of my head anytime I'm speaking up. And that's where the real fear comes from. You know, I don't know, but it's a small business. I've tried very hard and I have been, I have been very aware of my position and where I am. So like I have been very clean, very straightforward. The things that the guys do, like I could never do on tour. Like I, I, I would get a reputation. Like I've even had people say to me, like, <laughs> there was a tour that I got hired for where they almost were unsure about hiring me because another girl before had apparently been a partier, but she wasn't a partier. She just hung out with bands and stuff like that and would drink. They made it seem like she was sleeping around with everybody and that was what it was. And that wasn't what it was at all. And it was the same expectation was loaded onto me when I was interviewing for the same positions. I, I don't know. Like it's, it's terrifying to deal with it because the reality is the ramifications are my career. And that's what I'm thinking about every time I do it. Yeah. And, you know, when you were talking of kind of how, how it's a club, that's kind of like the, the underlying seediness that we find in our culture all over. I mean, with the police, right? Like, why do they get away with things? Because they're allowed to. Because yeah. nobody wants to hold them accountable. You know, why is the victim, the black man who gets shot, there's always a question, well, what did he do wrong? in order to deserve that. And I feel like that's something we get as women. That's something that we get as people of color. That's something that we get as LGBTQ+. Pretty much anyone who is the other, anyone who's different, you ha constantly have to deal with that question. Mm -hmm. And they all deal with the same thing I do. How is it going to affect my career? I have a very good friend of mine who has face more racism maybe than I can ever even imagine. She explains it to me and she's still the kindest, most wonderful person in the world, but that's 100% the truth. She's afraid of getting the reputation of being an angry black woman because as soon as a woman starts talking with force, particularly a black woman, she gets the angry black woman label and they my friend tries to avoid that astutely, but it's still, you know, and literally my friend is the kindest, most patient, soft-spoken, wonderful human you've ever met. That I can't even imagine that being a label attached to her, but that's something she fights against every day and in this business too because the reality is is there are even there are a few women, but there are even less black women in this business. So it's definitely it's a club and I've tried to change that. That's been something like I've really tried to change since I came to California. That's when we were talking about expectations. That's something that I also was an expectation. I expected all the women in California to be working together and talking to each other. And nobody was when I came here. Nobody was. None of the girls were. I went into a job at a, a professional production company, one of the big companies with another woman. We were on the same gig together. And I'm very like... The only reason they don't want you to talk about money in the business is because they don't want you to know what everybody else is making because then you're going to want it. And that's such nonsense. She was making $250 less than me for the gig. And she had lived in California her whole life and worked for the company for five years. And I was like, I'm really uncomfortable with this. I am uncomfortable with making more money than you are right now. You need to ask for more money. And she asked, she got more. She even made more than I did on that gig. And none of the women were talking, none of the women were giving each other gigs, none of that. So I kind of came in and was like, y'all got to stop. Like, yeah, we had sound girls, but like the top girls, the top ladies, like all the touring ladies weren't really talking to each other or like seating out g gigs to each other or anything. So I feel like that's kind of changed a little bit. I'm very much someone who like, I work as hard as I do so I can get more opportunity than I can take so I can give other people opportunities that deserve it particularly women who don't get a, the same shot as men do oftentimes, because I know that's what I went through in my own career. Um, so that's definitely something I, I work pretty hard on. I love that so much. I think it's really important to, to not just be in it for yourself. I mean, it really just comes down to that because a lot of people, maybe you're initially, it's money that's the motivator, or maybe it's getting to travel or whatever career you're in, right? It, it's always it, something outside of yourself. It's something mm -hmm. material. But I think when you can find that real 
reason to pull you, that why that you're always going to turn to. And it always comes down to having some sort of empathy for other people and sharing you know, what you have and sharing your knowledge and helping them do better. I think that's something that actually will translate to a long, sustainable career. That's exactly what I've tried to do. I try to mentor women. I I try to raise them up. I spend a lot of time supporting other women. I didn't have that when I was coming up. I didn't meet another woman in this business until I was like seven years into it. I had not even seen another one. So I, I, I very much try to make sure I'm visible because it's not about me. It's about the people that see me. And I've been very aware since the beginning of my career that I'm very visible. I mean, I have red hair for a reason. It makes me stand out amongst all the black. You know what I mean? It's my calling card. And it's important for us to be seen. Like the reputation I have and worked for is because I want other women to be able to get into the business. If I had a horrible reputation, if the women came up and we had bad reputations, then of course, like there wouldn't be opportunities available for other women. Um, So I very much, I very much worked very hard to allow others to have opportunity through my struggles, which is why I'm so vocal about the things that have happened to me now because I've already done it. What are you going to do? Fire me? I'm my own company. Right. <laughs> and then it's it's also having that team mentality, which I think is something that people who work in the industry, you know, the crew always has. It's that mm-hmm. you're trying to put on a show. There's a goal at the end of the night. And, you know, we kind of have to look at that also just in the minority groups that you have. Like, it's okay to have a group, but do it in a positive way. Do it to help each other and to help everyone as opposed to to shut people out. Exactly. Well, it's not like I'm exclusively giving my gigs to women. That's not true at all. I'm bringing in anybody I think is appropriate for whatever opportunities I get. Or if I think they're better for a position than I am, I recommend them in. I mean, that's happened multiple times this year where I knew that it was something, yeah, I could do it, but am I going to take the time to learn the parts of it that I don't know? No, I don't have that time. There's someone else that is way better suited for this than me. You know, and I love doing that. Like, it's why I've moved into more of a business side of things, because I love connecting people. I love making things happen. I love giving people opportunity. I love moving things forward. I love doing sound, but I think I love helping people more. Like, I I get so much more joy out of supporting someone and helping them succeed than even I do in my own success, if that makes sense. And it's definitely something I've I've only really realized in the, probably the last year or two that that is something that is very much a passion of mine. I feel that so much. And it's interesting that you say, because you, um, you said you're 30 now, right? Yeah. And I'm 32 <laughs> and our 20s. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I feel like there was a lot of selfishness yeah. in how I pursued a lot of things. But then something happens when you turn 30 or, you know, around that time where you start to realize that the world, this isn't all about me. It's about how I can impact other people Mm -hmm. and how they can grow from my mistakes. And, and how do I look at everything I wish I had and provide that to someone else? It's the next generation syndrome. It's like, we have kids, but don't. You know, like we're looking, I'm already, because I am considering the women that came after me. And that's the reality. We're looking at the next generation. We're trying to secure their success. We might not have kids, but maybe I might not ever have kids. Who knows? But I'm trying to help the next generation to succeed. I feel like that's what it is. We've gotten old enough now. We've hit it. We see it. We're older now. We're not the younger generation. I think that's 30 is when it happens. Like you're not in your 20s anymore. And so all of a sudden the reality clicks in. You're like, I'm not a kid anymore. I can't get away with the things I got anymore. And you know what? There are younger people coming up doing the same job as me and I want to support them. You know, I feel like that's what it is. Yeah, for sure. And it's, it's so strange to just feel comfortable with it. Like it's, it's, it's not difficult. It just, it just happens. And I feel like understanding that it does happen to, I would say, I would bet that it happens to the majority of people. I would say that it, that very few people don't have that need to really help others. Maybe it's blurred. Maybe they haven't quite discovered it yet, but I feel like at some point it is there or it's hiding somewhere in the background. 
Well, it manifests itself in different ways and different people. The way I help people is very outright. The way that other people might help people is could be very subtle. They might not have the confidence to be able to help people themselves all the way that they want to, but it's still a passion. You know, it might be as simple as sending a, hey, I love you text. That might be their version of that, where mine is, I want to raise you up. There's different degrees of everything. Um, and it's just about how you do it. Recognizing it is important, of course, but I find that most people innately like to help people if given the opportunity. So uh, I create opportunities for kindness in my everyday I very much try to be kind to others. You know, I've been homeless. I've lived in my car. I've been hungry. I, I've been all of these things. So I very much try to keep compassion in my everyday for everyone and everything. And sometimes, of course, we suck and we fall off the wagon. And sometimes we're mad and treat people badly. But most of us that have this uh, want to help people passion in us will come back to those moments be like I'm so sorry I did not mean to treat you that way that's not who I am like I was having a bad day or I had PMS or whatever the thing was like PMS is the big one the PMS is real <laughs> <laughs> I'm like I still it's only two weeks out of the month that I'm crazy only two I have days I only have like a couple of days and I'm always like shocked and I have to like go back and be like I am so sorry like I literally didn't even know that was happening I I never understood it when I was younger, but now that I'm older and I don't know, it's the 30 thing, like we talked about, you know, like the hormonal stuff. I don't know. But now I definitely look at that in a whole different way. It's true. Sometimes I'll joke around and I'll be like, oh, um, I think it's a full moon and my period's about a week away. So I yeah, have, I, I'm really sorry. Please don't take anything I just said personally. <laughs> I had one day last week where I pretty much just yelled at everybody all day and I didn't realize that I was doing it until my friend that I was talking to was like, why are you being such a bitch? And I was like, and I was like, oh, you're right. I am. And I had to call the people that I had talked to and be like, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. And I, I, I take that into my job too, by the way, like, uh, you know, when we're touring, we're not always perfect. We're cranky. We're tired. We're hungry. We're sick. We're whatever. And sometimes you're, you're a jerk or you're you're a dick to somebody and you don't mean to be. Some people don't apologize, but I'm very much that someone that'll be like, I am so sorry. I don't care if you hate my guts. I just want you to know that I'm sorry that I was being a dick. And there are other times where I'm so stubborn that maybe I lose friends over it. But eventually, most of the time, I can realize that I'm being an idiot. Wow. I mean, apologizing is hard. <laughs> It is. You know, so <laughs> how do you how do you get better at apologizing? <laughs> you just keep doing it. Cuz the reality is, is we mess up every day. You get better at apologizing when you start really looking at yourself and start understanding that the scenario you're in wasn't just created by the other person. Much of what happened it has to do with you. And when you were talking about relationships on the road and stuff like that, how we deal with that, that's another thing. A lot of relationships with touring people don't do well. And we don't like to look at ourselves and see that a part of that is because of us. We live in a moment. We live in moments. And sometimes it's hard to include people in our moments and communicate with them. And so it, it strains things. And I feel like it's the same way with apologizing. We live in a world where we just have to keep going. And sometimes it's hard to take a stop and take a look at ourselves. And I think that's a very important thing to do is to take a second and look at ourselves and our actions and what we're doing and, and not just blame the other person. So that's kind of like, like, I'll, I'm at the point now where I'll just apologize for something. I didn't even have to do it. That's where I'm at. One of the conversations I have with people up and coming in the business, I'm a monitor engineer a lot. One of the things I have to say is, look, the reality is, is you're going to have to accept responsibility for something that you probably didn't do. And you're going to have to accept the reality that you might lose your job over it. And that is the cost. And that is what it is. That is accepting responsibility. That is what it is. So accepting responsibility is how you apologize. Yes. And tell me a little bit more about, um, no, I'm absolutely, and practicing, right? Except you you practice because yeah. it's hard. Every single time you have to apologize, especially if you really don't think you did anything wrong. <laughs> and It's hard. And don't speak out of anger. I've started to have this thing and I'm glad that it's instituted itself because I used to be someone who would just like word vomit whatever I was thinking, but now I'll write it out and I'll delete it. And then I'll write it again and it's almost always better the second time. Like it's not angry. It's more well thought out. It's not it just helps me get the mad out 
and that's not what people that's not what people react to when you're apologizing. They don't want that part. They don't want the anger, the any of that. They want the they want the truth. They want the you. They don't want the reaction. They want the words. They want the truth. And reacting is not an appropriate way to apologize. Right. And I love that, you know, the the writing it down, letting everything out because it's okay to be angry. I think it's it's perfectly fine. It's part of the process. But that's a great tip to just write it all out and then pick out the parts that you really mean because we don't want to have to constantly be going back saying, well, I didn't mean it that way or I didn't mean to say that part. Earlier, like a minute ago, you said something about living in the moment. Mm -hmm. You said that when you tour, you're living in a a moment and it's hard to translate that to your partner. Tell me a little bit more about that. So for me, when I started touring previously, like when I started touring full time, I was actually in a lo- a full time relationship. Like I lived with a person, and it was really hard. I think that a lot of relationships that start with someone not touring end up failing. Like if I started dating this person when we when I was already touring, that would be already established. Like that's who we are. But because we started before then when I started leaving, it was very difficult. And the lives that we led were so different. You know, even if you think they were like when you're on tour, you are and every second of your day on somebody else's schedule, every second of your day, even on days off, if something happens, they can call you into work, you're on somebody else's schedule on their time on their whim on their call. Sometimes I can't look at my phone for eight hours. And every day we're creating the same thing, the same show over and over again, the same moment. And for a lot of us, it's like Groundhog's Day, like same thing over and over and over again. And a lot of us get to the point where we're like, oh, where are you? I have no idea. You could have asked me at any point this year, where am I in the country? And I'd be like, uh, I don't, I have no clue. Uh, where are you going tomorrow? Doesn't matter. Nah, it doesn't matter. It, it really doesn't matter. I'm going to get off the bus. I'm going to load in the show. I'm going to do the show. I'm going to get back on the bus. And then we're going to go in the morning and get on the it's like repetitive. And then the people at home, their lives keep going on. My life has been on pause for six, six weeks. Not much progress has been made in many things. People are building businesses, have jobs, have relationships, have families. And all of that for me is on pause for six weeks or more months. You know, I was out for Lizzo this year. It was a whole year. So we create moments for people. We, that is what we do. A show is a moment, a memory. It's not a, you know, you don't go back to a con- that same concert. The next time you go, it's different. Even that concert is different from the same exact one the next night. So we create moments. And so therefore, we live in moments. And it's hard to come back to someone who's living a life where it's like full and not fragmented. I very much feel like we have a fragmented life a little bit. When you're doing the job, it's hard to have the personal side of the things. But when you're the personal side of things, almost you can't do the job. So it's hard. It's a hard balance. I'm trying to picture kind of how that would look. It's almost like if you have a movie versus a 20 minute episode of The Office. Yes. Your partner who's at home would be living this long movie, three hour movie or something. (laughs) Get up, have coffee, go to work, live a life. But every day. You're just re- you're just redoing um, just another episode in, in a short series with the same sort of structure. Mm-hmm. And if you're on a tour, that's you know this is just a one time thing. You might not ever talk or see any of those people again. It's not necessarily like you're establishing friendships all the time. It's a little weird to explain to people. I very much felt like I would leave for tour and his life would progress. And I was kind of left behind. Like I didn't know what was going on anymore. He wasn't including me. Communication gets hard. Um, I mean, even communicating in our world is hard uh, consistently. Like when I'm loading in at 8 a.m., setting up my entire show the whole morning, going into sound check, and maybe after sound check, have some time to look at my phone. That's like eight to nine hours. And then people are like, why don't you answer me? And be like, I literally didn't look at my phone for eight hours, didn't look at it. And so it's been a really rough struggle for me with even friends for them to understand that. Like, I don't live my life by the phone. I don't live my life by the internet. I don't live my life by social media or anything that my life is in the moment. It's right in front of me every day. And I have to be present and completely with it for me to fully do my job. So I'm sorry that I can't pay attention to this at the times you want me to. But I like, I really love and respect you and I would like to talk to you, but you have to understand that I can't. And it's hard for them when they don't know our lives and our days and the way that our jobs work to understand that. 
I mean, you saying it, if I hadn't actually been in like a five-year relationship with someone who toured, it wouldn't actually have made any sense. And I probably, like, I feel like the average person would literally listen to what you just said and be like, so what are you, what does that say about me? Are you trying to say that all I do is sit on my phone all day? That, and that's, that's where I feel like a lot of conflict can happen because it's like you're trying to explain to them. It's not you. It's me. It's my job. It's my schedule. I want to fit you in there, but it's hard to explain my day. actual experience. Yeah. Because well, the day is so uncertain. The day moves. We might be running two hours behind for load in. We might have an issue that arises where we're like two hours behind for sound check. We might have problems for the show where I have to work straight through sound check in our break. There's just these things. And sometimes it's a whole day before I can get to talk to someone on the phone. And that's so hard when you've lived with someone, like when you're the person that's there when they wake up and they go to bed. And also it's a really hard transition to make back from off the road. And I know a lot of people struggle with that, like coming off the road and going home. It was really hard for me. It was very hard for me to walk straight back into a relationship where someone was touching me and being around me. Cause very much when I'm on tour as a female, I'm like, do not touch me. No one crosses this line. I have to shut it down. And then you come off tour and you're supposed to be like emotional and vulnerable and back with someone that is kind of a stranger almost after eight weeks as much as we maybe have talked on the phone like it's still kind of sometimes weird to go back and be with that person and oftentimes they don't understand the transitions we have to go to to come back it's very much like the military you know I talked to a lot of military people and the life that we live is very similar to the life that they live and so like my adopted little brother talks to me all the time because he went in the marines And he's like, you're the only one that understands my life. So, you know, we talk now a lot because I have a very similar life to him. So um, it's all about the transition. And that's the hardest part. And that's what a lot of people struggle with is tour blues, (laughs) tour depression. It's because we have been had such a structured day for every single day. And now we have no purpose. Like now we don't have a show to put on. We have nothing. So it's such a hard transition for our brain. Yeah, your life is literally turned upside down. How do you work through that? I had to learn that our significant others don't understand us always completely. And what is effective for us is not effective for them. And sometimes they don't really understand our needs. For me, when I come home from tour, I want it silent. I need a day by myself, not doing anything, no stimulation, dark room, maybe playing video games nothing like I need no one no interaction with anyone because I'm an introvert and my recharge is by myself and when you're in a relationship with someone it's really hard for them to understand that without making them feel bad and it's not them it's me it's that I can't be comfortable until I do this if you come out and try to touch me I'm gonna like "Eh," I might flinch away a little bit like I need to have a day or two and so I had to make a realization that it was affecting my significant other when I would come home and be like that so I started to take a day or two in a hotel, like I would go somewhere for two days before I would come home after a tour and take that time by myself and not have the pressure. And it was something we talked about, made it more comfortable. It was also hard for him to understand that too. I feel like there are different types of people. And sometimes if an introvert is dating an extrovert, they don't sometimes understand the introversion. I'm very much an introvert. I'm an extroverted introvert. I can be an extrovert, but my meter runs out pretty fast you can see it and I need to recharge. And he just couldn't understand that. And since I'm a sound engineer, sound stimulation is what um, kind of drives me up the wall while I'm in that state. And my big thing is he would wake up in the morning and as soon as he woke up, turn on the radio, we'd be laying on the bed and there would be like a talk host on. And I literally would go insane. And like, it's not him. He's been living his life. This is how he lives his life. The whole time that I'm gone, this is his life. How am I coming back and disrupting his whole life so that I started to do things to make me a little bit more comfortable? Lorreen, honestly, there was a major fight that I used to have with my ex, and it was over my blender because I would make a green smoothie every morning. And he just hated it. And he was he was an audio engineer. So like just hate it. And I was like, why do you hate my green smoothie? What's wrong with you? And you just made it click so much. Yep. It's the sound stimulation. I'm still like that. I go out into nature because there are no cars or anything. I can't hear anything. Audio engineers were trained. That's what we're trained is to hear everything all the time. And so it doesn't really go away in normal life. I still hear like a freaking, uh, like a cat 
<laughs> like, so, um, yeah, it's, you just have to understand your needs and also their needs. Communication has to be open. The reason our relationship failed is because communication got hard and getting comfortable with each other got hard and understanding missing each other and the way we miss each other and communicating about that damaged us. And it's still a person I love very much in this life. It's just the life I'm living now is not compatible with his. And then you just have to accept it. Yeah, I completely hear that. And I think one of the biggest takeaways too is to understand that when you're having that communication, you have to have the same goal in mind. If both people are are in agreement that no one's trying to win, that it's not really a power struggle. It's not about whether my needs are more important than your needs. It's about us fixing the issue and us creating something that where we can both be happy. Mm -hmm. And I think if that leads every conversation, it'll definitely help you actually solve problems. Exactly. And even sometimes if you do that, sometimes the differences are just too much. And the reality is, is, um, you have to understand what you need. We were talking about being selfish and you have to be in certain ways. I've been on my own for my whole life. And one of the things that very much allowed me to get to where I am is that I realized that no one is going to do it for me. No one can accomplish my dreams, but me, no one can hold me accountable, but me, no one can change my behavior, but me. And so that's very much something that I have taken into my life. It's about my needs and nobody else but me is going to look out for what I need in this world because the reality is, is everyone else is looking out for what they need. Well, and we can't help other people and we can't do better for the world if we don't take care of ourselves. Correct. Like I had to be mentally, I had to do all the mental work that I have had to do to get to where I am now. And that took years, years to get to this point. So, you know, it's going to take time. It's uncomfortable. All these changes, being a human, like we get stuck in a cycle and being on a road of almost being like an automaton. Sometimes I feel like we just wake up, do our thing. And I think that when we come back from quarantine and we start stepping on the road again, I think a lot of crew people's views on the way that they have their job and, and participate in their job are going to be different. I don't think the sacrifice of personal life and career is going to to be as stacked as it was before because I think so many of us are realizing how important it is to have a personal life like these four months that I've been home from quarantine have been incredibly important for me in rebuilding my personality and my emotional state and who I am as a person I've become kinder I've become the person that I was a couple like <laughs> five years ago the person that I, I left and you don't realize that change is happening until you can stop and step back and look at yourself and have the time to spend with yourself and not spend with someone else's dreams i need to spend some time with mine that was honestly a really great conversation i feel like it was it's really needed to have these these types of conversations and just really learn from other people's experiences. Is there anything that you want to share before we go that helps you keep going? Yes. I've made it to where I am in this business in spite of everyone saying things to me. I don't come from anything. You know, you've heard me talk about I was homeless. I dropped out of college. I didn't even get an associate's degree. I lived in my car. I didn't do anything. And I created for myself this career, an incredible career where I travel the world and I meet new people and I get to create music. And I have such an en enriched and fulfilled life doing what I do. I just want to tell people that you can do whatever you want. There's nothing holding you back but yourself. Your circumstances are not holding you back. You, nothing is holding you back but what you say in your brain. You can do whatever you want. Nothing is in stone. Nothing is certain. And if you're not happy, change it. Yes. There we go. Perfect. Absolutely. If you're not happy, change it. And we have control. I love it. Thank you so, so much for coming on the podcast and chatting with me. Thank you for having me. I look forward to future conversations with you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us on The Tour Life. Please remember to rate and review the show and also to share with someone you love. You are truly the key to our growth. For updates on my guests, my own personal reflections and exclusive behind the scenes content, follow me everywhere at J9Richards.